Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Colon. I'm the Director of Public Engagement at NPIA. Uh, I have to forewarn you that the more engaging part of this program will be my partner, Alain Gerwart, from the FCC, but if you suffer through with me, we'll get to the fun part. Um, I'm coming up on my two-year anniversary with the Internet for All programs, and um, I feel like I can honestly sum up and succinctly sum up the first part, the where we did part of the business presentation by saying for our, uh, our to seats and this administration, we've been pretty busy. And uh, I hope you'll agree by the end of the presentation that up to now, we've been able to accomplish quite a bit. Starting, uh, as you see up in the background, on November 15, 2021, President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure law, a $1.2 trillion, about one of the dairy's best in the nation's vital infrastructure and economic competitiveness. Uh, that law included $65 billion, once again, a once a generation investment, um, aimed at providing every American with access to affordable, reliable, high speed internet service, as well as the Digital seal screen and devices he to once and for all close our nation's digital divide. Um, NTIA was tasked with administering the bulk of these funds, and I am happy to report that up to now we have met every statutory deadline and IFA program objective. For instance, by May of 2022, we had issued notices of funding on our committee for both the largest of those programs, the $42.5 billion BEAT program, as well as the Digital Equity C uh, Landing Grant program. By the end of that summer, we were still batting 1,000 when we were able to get all 56 eligible states and territory to opt to apply and opt in to both of those programs. Um, both the B and the B of elected before we with the no small accomplishment in this day and age to get every state uh, leadership government office to sign on to a program um, that has equity in the thing. Um, so uh, fast forward in June of 2023, and as you can see up on the screen, um, when uh, thanks to our partners at FPC and their new broadband maps, uh, President Biden and uh, Commerce Secretary Raimondo were able to announce the allocation for every one of the 56 uh, states and territory of the Booth Program, uh, award allocating between 107 million up to 3.1 billion. Again, to ensure the President profits to connect every American with affordable, reliable, high speed internet service. This fall, we collaborated with the state broadband offices, our 56 federal, NTI 56 federal program officers, as well as every type of stakeholder organization to ensure that the states were able to, by the deadline again, December 27 of this year, uh, submit both volumes of their beat initial plans to NT for NTIA review and approval. Once we approve those, they'll have access to up to 20% of those allocated funds to begin implementing their programs. I want to get to what's next, but I need to mention that we've also uh, hit no foes and made awards in two critically important programs, uh, our Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program, as well as our Bit of Miles Water and Start the Program. Um, and finally, that our Connecting Minority Community Pilot Program has awarded over $200 million to historically black colleges and universities, uh, tribal colleges and universities, and Hispanic serving institutions uh, to purchase high speed internet service and equipment, as well as to hire, say, technologists for desperately need technology first time. So uh, moving on to what's next. What's next, you may ask. So uh, right now, the states and territories 
are engaging in their bead state challenge process. Under the challenge process, states must publish their proposed bead eligible locations before they can award any bead farms. Local governments and registered nonprofits can then challenge those eligibility determinations to ensure that bean funds go to where they are most needed. Uh, my Office of Public Engagement uh, is teaming with NTIA's Office of Intergovernmental Affairs and our state federal program officers to ensure maximum outreach and participation in the bean count process. Next, next the bean subgranting process, the money becomes available. Um, once they've completed that challenge process and NTIA has approved their initial plans, states and territories will be able to begin to solicit proposals for the B funds, uh, subgranting proposals. And with that in mind, NTIA has been partnering with uh, the, yes, the Small Business Administration, uh, as well as affinity organizations like the U.S. Black Chambers, Inc. Um, to ensure that small minority-owned and women-owned businesses have every opportunity to participate in the BEAT program. Uh, and finally, uh, the Digital State Capacity Building Program, uh, $1.44 billion um, uh, is preparing to, the program is preparing to issue uh, their NOFO for that program coming up shortly. Uh, last year, the program uh, solicited requests for comments and got hundreds of submissions from individuals and organizations, which the DE team has used to inform the NUFO, uh, which is coming out imminently. Uh, states and territories were previously able to use, if you remember, all the way back in the beginning of this talk, eons ago, um, the DE state planning grant capacity, uh, planning grant program. States and territories were able to use those planning grant funds to put together uh, digital equity for our digital opportunity plans. And I'm happy to report that for the first time ever, every state and territory in the United States will have its own digital equity uh, or digital opportunity plan to begin to address the digital divide in their state. Uh, and with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Porter. All on game. Hi. Um, Good morning, afternoon. My name is Ahmed Rourke, and I'm the chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. I'm at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, Mark is really great at making all of the work that they're doing. Um, feel like it's just, uh, let's cross this off our, our list, kind of bullet points, but as you can imagine, it's been a ton, a ton of work, and a lot of close coordination, I think, between the FCC and NTIA and uh, across the federal government. Um, and it's always um, good to be able to partner um, to chat about um, how we're all kind of coming together to bridge our country's digital opportunity divide. So I actually wanted to start with um, a map uh, that I think we're still trying to get out in, into the world. So as Mark mentioned, a lot of, of funding has been allocated at the state and, and at the and local level. And so uh, the FCC, you know, as directed by the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, also has a map where we have layered um, and visualized all um, broadband funding that has uh, been allocated across the country. So this map is, is being continually updated. Um, and so you can go to uh, fundingmap.fcc.gov um, and you can play with, you know, at the state and, and, and local level and see how all those resources either overlap, um, complement each other, um, and, and you'll know kind of where the data is coming from. So that is, I think, a valuable tool as a lot of these projects are, are beginning to break ground across the country um, and you know, a way for us to kind of really be able to be intentional and thoughtful um, and harmonize a lot of these efforts to ensure that we are um, achieving our goal of universal access and adoption. So um, for us over the course of the past uh, few years, the FCC has made significant progress establishing new tools to expand digital opportunity and to promote digital equity. You know, for us, part of what that means in, in um, in process, right, um, it, or in practice, is that we have um, a, we are working to ensure that we have an internet that is fast, open, and fair to all. Um, it means that we have are working to ensure that we have accurate maps with granular level data, so that we know exactly where broadband is and broadband is it, which is a big deal. Um, that we as consumers have consistent and reliable information, so that we can select an internet service plan that best meets our household needs and our long-term budget. And we are doing this through our new broadband nutrition labels, um, 
We have also been working hard to bridge the broadband affordability gap with the Affordable Connectivity Program. I know that many of us are really tuned into um, the Affordable Connectivity Program and what's going to happen next. So I'm going to dive into that um, a little bit later. Um, and it also means that we have established a framework to prevent and eliminate digital discrimination. And I think personal to me in my bureau is that we have an accessible and inclusive uh, stakeholder engagement process that really allows the agency to promote policies um, that expand digital opportunity to everyone everywhere. So I am super happy to be able to share some uh, updates on these really important um, topics. Um, and I want to start off with our broadband, um, our, our national broadband map. So the Broadband Data Act uh, was um, a directive from Congress um, and was established to develop a new map that had highly granular um, information. So the first map, the first iteration of this map was um, it was published in November of 2022, the second version in May of 2023, the third version in uh, November of 2023, and essentially has uh, and visualizes all uh, fixed service availability, and it's depicted on a location by location basis. And uh, mobile coverage is based on standardized propagation parameters to ensure um, comparability among providers. So an important feature of this map, um, for those of you that have not had a chance to play with it, in the past, you know, uh, service providers would be able to say, hey, we, we cover all of these places. Um, and we would say, thank you. That's really great. Um, thank you for being good people. Um, but now all of us have a voice in what shows up in that map because we can type in our address, we can type in our state, we can type in our city, and we can see exactly what was reported by the internet service providers. And in that same place, without going anywhere else, we can challenge that information. We can say, you know what, I have tried to get the service, I have tried to call uh, or um, and it's not available to me or I'm not getting the service that is that is advertised um, and all of that can be done with just a few clicks on this map so I encourage everybody to check it out if you haven't had a chance to play with it um, and it's a really good tool to get out into the community crowdsourcing really works here um, so send it out to all of your folks uh, because we the goal here is to ensure that we have the most up-to-date and accurate um, maps of where broadband is and then all across the country and so that um, is really um, awesome and what we want um, all of us to be working on. So in December 2023, um, the fabric was released to licensees, right? So that is the next step here. And providers must report updated availability data as of December 31st, 2023 uh, to us by March 1st. So the availability data will be overlaid onto the updated fabric and will appear um, in a public map in the spring. So just want to kind of underscore that the FCC continues to accept location and availability challenges um, on an ongoing and rolling basis. That those challenges are processed and resolved um, as we get them, um, and they continue to be kind of uh, resolved um, to as, as a way to improve the map um, as they come in. So that is something that doesn't ever go away. Um, and we have a lot of great resources for either our community partners or people that want to really kind of do a deep dive on what is in the map, how to work it. Um, if you really want to get into the data, if you want to export data, um, you can find all that information at FCC.gov forward slash broadband data. The other thing that I'm really excited about um, are our new broadband nutrition labels, and we will start seeing those hit the streets here in just uh, this year. So um, get excited, and I wanted to give you guys a few quick, quick updates. So in November of 2022, the commission unveiled new rules that would, for the first time, require broadband providers to display easy to understand labels um, to allow us as consumers to comparison shop for broadband services. Um, we've all kind of um, had the experience of shopping for broadband and then getting that first bill and then seeing the price that was advertised plus all the fees, plus the installation fee, plus all these things that you never even heard of, right? And really getting, uh, being faced with the reality of that monthly charge. Uh, once we get that monthly bill, and that is probably not the best time to really be able to figure out um, how much you're going to be paying per month. Um, and so uh, the, the broadband labels allow consumers to be able to comparison shop, um, and it, it will ensure that there is um, pricing transparency across the ecosystem. Um, so consistent with our rules, large providers must begin displaying the labels on April 10th. Uh, 2024, and smaller providers will have until October 10th, 2024. Um, the FCC, um, we are working to assist providers in meeting this requirement, and so the commission will make certain resources such as uh, uh, templates 
um, for, for the labels that will be available on our websites at least 30 days before the requirements go into effect. So broadband labels, get excited about them because we're going to start seeing them everywhere um, that you shop for broadband. And I think um, two quick things, and because I know that we're also very tuned in about um, our efforts to prevent and eliminate digital discrimination. So as you might know, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act tasked the FCC with the responsibility to adopt rules and achieve uh, the prevention and elimination of digital discrimination. Um, and so as a part of that, uh, we established the Task Force to Prevent Digital Discrimination with the Monetary, Sanford Williams, and myself, and we did a lot of outreach all across the country. We hosted listening sessions, we did stakeholder roundtables. Uh, we ensured that the perspective of impacted communities were a part of that record so that we were able to uh, put pen to paper and develop model rules and policies that really, I think, were responsive to um, the real world um, circumstances on the ground. And so I think, because um, I know that we're running out of time, so I will just say there is a um, further notice out there that I think we encourage all of you guys to continue to participate in. And so um, the further notice um, asks different types of questions, right, about um, should we require broadband providers to um, annually submit to the FCC information about any large-scale broadband deployment, upgrade, or maintenance projects? Um, should we establish a mandatory internal compliance program? Um, and finally, we're asking further comment on whether the FCC should establish an Office of Civil Rights. So we are, we, by we, I mean the FCC and the task force, uh, continue to be really interested in your uh, feedback, um, in your perspective. And so uh, we welcome your participation in the rulemaking process. And so comments on the further notice are due March 4th and reply comments by April 1st. So please uh, tune in, check it out, and let us know what you think. And lastly, um, I want to talk about the Affordable Connectivity Program. Uh, there we go. Uh, the Affordable Connectivity Program. Here's what I'll say. One, the Affordable Connectivity Program is working, right? As of this year, over 23 million households across the country um, now have the internet connection that they need to connect to the world around us. I think all of us know that there is no big or small task that we do on a day-to-day -day that sustain critical aspects of our everyday lives that don't in some way involve being connected to the internet. So ensuring that, that everybody has the ability to connect is paramount. I think it also um, creates a sustainable funding source for all these new um, infrastructure projects that are uh, gonna be uh, breaking ground and are breaking ground across the country. Um, and so we, in, we are in an, the unfortunate kind of position where you know, we are quickly um, kind of arriving at the financial fiscal cliff for the affordable connectivity program. So without, I think, congressional action that will give us more funds um, to the program, um, we are forecasting that the program will run out in about April of this year. So really, really a big deal, but I want to, I think, highlight a lot of the work that we've all done together in this room, across the country, you know, 23 million households in, in, in enrolled, uh, 20, 228 ACP outreach grants issued, national media campaign, uh, federal agency partnerships across the federal government. Uh, we launched two navigator pilots. We have multilingual support center. We have multilingual resources um, for how to enroll, how to get people through the enrollment process. So it really has been a team lift. And I think really great to this program is um, very explicit um, consumer protections that are a part of this program. Um, that again, the number one most cited bear for why people that don't have internet today don't have internet is because of the price and the affordable connectivity program is bridging that gap. So I wanted to share with you guys some key dates and then we can kind of wrap up. Um, so key dates, um, late January, 2024, households currently receiving the ACP monthly benefit started receiving notices from the internet service providers, letting them know that um, the end of the ACP could potentially happen. Um, since February 8th, there is now an enrollment freeze in the program. So there will be no more enrollment in the affordable connectivity program until, and hopefully when Congress gives us more money. Um, and again, I'll underscore that uh, based on the current enrollment rates, um, April is when we uh, anticipate the funds to kind of run out. So the FCC anticipates existing ACB funding to run out at the end of April. Um, and potentially a partial benefit available in May if Congress does not provide additional funding. 
Um, so households that are enrolled in the ACP will continue to receive their benefit um, on their internet service through April of 2024. Um, and so we encourage folks um, to continue to lift up the stories of success of the program. Um, I think that that is really gonna go a long way. Um, and as always, we have a lot of support for all of our partners, uh, just like we had at the beginning of the program where the FCC was there with you in your community, doing webinars, you know, ensuring that people knew how to enroll um, and all of the, um, the background for the program. We are now offering that same level of support um, throughout the wind down process. I think a lot of consumers will begin to have a lot of questions once they start getting all their notices from providers, once they start getting notices from USAC. So again, we are there to, and we have part of our team that does that, Renee um, and Kayla, please raise your hands. Uh, these are our folks. Um, and they are happy to, again, either ship you, uh, wind down fact sheets, print them to you. They can do webinars. So again, that, that intense kind of level of support that we had at the beginning of the program, we are now offering it right now to ensure that all of our stakeholders at the community level understand the impact to consumers and that I think consumers have all the resources that they need, especially again, uh, because a lot of those consumer protections continue to be in place as we, I hate, it breaks my heart to stay wide down the ACP, um, but that is where we are today. And that is it for NTIA and FCC. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>